Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Tea Time and Tension, a production of Fanfare Industries. I'm your host, Micah R. Maloney, one of Fanfare Industries' founders, as well as founder of Red Rock Gaming and co-founder of First Taste Multimedia. More about those and other videos coming soon enough. But you're not here for that today. No, you're here because of something simply sophisticated and nuanced. You're here because of a little show put forth on YouTube Red. A show maybe you've binged to completion. Or maybe you've just watched the first episode to gauge its value before paying for subscription to the streaming platform's premium service. Or perhaps you're just somewhere in between. You're here about Cobra Kai, and this episode's title, The Yin and Yang of Cobra Kai. Before I begin, a hard warning that this video will be filled with the most dreaded thing in modern history. Spoilers. If you don't want to have details of the plot spoiled, exit out of this video. Watch Cobra Kai in full now. Come back after. We'll be waiting. Because in this case, there truly is no mercy. Okay. That's long enough for those who want to leave. If you forgot to, do it now. Some see the show as merely a cash grab for the sake of those suffering from nostalgia. A cheap continuation of the series for the sake of keeping the franchise going. Especially in a time when nostalgia for American 1980s pop culture is booming. Others see it as a worthy continuation preferable to some of the other works in the series. Still others haven't even watched the first film, The Karate Kid, but they've been turned on to it by watching the show. If you haven't seen the first film, you probably should. Regardless of where you lie within the debate or your attachment to the franchise, Cobra Kai is stirring up a bit of buzz. There was a fair bit of hype before the first episode was released. Heck, even before the first trailer was released. The Karate Kid is one of the great American underdog stories in the history of film. A sequel, placed back in the valley, starring some of the original actors decades later, there was no way it wouldn't gain hype. But the question on every fan's mind was simple, would it be any good? The answer, in my opinion, is a resounding YES. In fact, while Cobra Kai wouldn't exist without the films prior to it, the first season stands well enough on its own and is equal, if not greater, than the original. No, 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 no. Put down your pitchforks. The original film had great acting from several individuals and a great story. However, the franchise had reached a peak with it that made the production company want to build upon it. Not out of respect for the story, but for opportunity to milk the series for financial gain. It's the right of a business to do so with their product. However, it made the films that followed a diminished value narratively. Eventually, even Ralph Macchio refused to come back to keep the series going. Did that make Columbia stop? No. The next Karate Kid came next. Personally, I liked the film, even if many didn't. But it wasn't in the same vein as the first film. There was an attempt to revitalize the franchise with a reboot in 2010. It starred Jackie Chan and Jaden Smith. I loved it for what it did, even if it would have done just as well as a new franchise. It still might get a sequel, but years have passed making Jaden older. However, back in 2007, the music video for Sweep the Leg by No More Kings starred many of the living actors from the original film and drew a lot of fan reaction. It starred William Zabka, Johnny Lawrence himself, unable to give up reliving the old film and eventually facing the frontman for the band in the famous arena, this time defeating his foe. It's simply magnificent if you haven't seen it yet. This, coupled with many internet fan theories, pushed the notion of Daniel LaRusso as the true villain of the story. Or at least not quite the underdog we were led to believe. Johnny either was then, or had become it now. Did the creators of Cobra Kai pay attention to these things for almost a decade before the series started to be filmed? I honestly can't answer that. But I'm certain that with the love for the original franchise that the creators clearly had, it wouldn't surprise me. Johnny Lawrence lost to Daniel LaRusso in the first film, 
and some claim that he shouldn't have due to technicalities or expertise from his years versus Daniel's limited training. No matter how you sliced it, fans were excited when they heard the franchise was continuing. Rabid when they heard the synopsis and that Ralph Macchio and William Zabka, as well as many others, would be coming back for the first season of this new show. That Ralph Macchio, of all actors in the franchise, would come back? It spoke volumes to the fans, considering his reluctance to come back after the third film, save for his cameo in Sweep the Lake. Cobra Kai had an audience primed and ready to devour it, to binge it until they were done or sick of it. Some feared its writers didn't have the pathos in their filmography. Others feared that age would have worn too hard on the cast, but the majority were hopeful. Such a small, tender thing, hope. It's why we love the underdog. They know they are outclassed, but they are confident that they stand a chance. Because they've got heart. Because they're the hero. Even when reality tells us that the underdog usually loses. At the time of this recording, Cobra Kai has been out for 11 days. Were the fans satisfied? Hell no! They were starving for more. YouTube Red renewed it for another season within 10 days. 10 days. Aside from series that are renewed before going live, that is one of the fastest responses for renewal, and to be honest, that's just the public knowing it was renewed. The cast and crew likely knew they had it in the bag at the moment it went live. So Cobra Kai is a success. It didn't fall hard on its ass like some feared, but equal to the original, possibly better? Surely, I must be mad, right? Wrong. And don't call me Shirley. An oldie but a goodie, no matter what you say. The original film was all about Daniel LaRusso and his bond with Sensei Mr. Miyagi, wonderfully played by Pat Morita. Oh, and also a bit about Daniel and his mom, and Daniel and his girlfriend, who didn't show up in any of the sequel movies. But really, it was about Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. Daniel was trying to fit in within a new town, a new school, and having to deal with the recent loss of his father. He found love, or, well, a relationship at least, but with the ex-girlfriend of Johnny Lawrence. At this point, the film had made it clear we are meant to cheer for Daniel, despite how he sucker-punched Johnny, and how Johnny at first just dodged Daniel to prove he didn't stand a chance. Sure, he was a jerk, especially to his ex-girlfriend, but at that instant, the two could have become friends instead of bitter rivals. The two exchanged barbs and punches, and it became clear they hate each other. But Johnny has more friends willing to help him beat up Daniel. Still, Daniel wasn't a complacent victim, he fought back. He just wasn't trained, and he held anger in his heart, not just an urge for justice. The story continues on with him getting trained eventually, after his sensei is convinced that he needs the help to settle things with honor at the tournament, as well as to help calm the troubled spirit in the young lad. As anyone who has watched the original film can recall, Daniel won the tournament in the end with a famous crane kick, which some claim would have been illegal under tournament rules. This is even given a nod within Cobra Kai, but dismissed by Daniel when Johnny mentions it almost casually. From the tournament on, we don't see much about Johnny in the original films, except at the start of the second film, where his own sensei started beating on him for failing in the tournament. To be honest, most agree, myself included, that this is one of the best things about the second film, which could have easily fit into the first film for pure satisfaction and wrapping things up nicely. It's just a shame it didn't end there for the films. However, that little bit is integral to Cobra Kai, among other things that Johnny said and did in the first film. Cobra Kai may not have existed without the original franchise films, but it sufficiently summarizes details of them that apply to Johnny in such a way that you can watch Cobra Kai without seeing any of the films. I would still recommend watching the first film and the first segment of the second. The rest you can do without, unless you really don't want to give up watching them for the sake of completion of the franchise before watching Cobra Kai. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. 
Those were the tenants of the original Cobra Kai Dojo, which Johnny Lawrence revives after encountering Danny LaRusso again after decades of avoiding him, after defending a teenager who then asked Johnny to train him. Just like Mr. Miyagi, Johnny refused initially, but came around to the idea, eventually coming to take pride in his student. Eventually, helping his student to win the same tournament that he lost his senior year. His student against Daniel's student. Johnny finally wins, but in winning, he loses. In following the tenets of Cobra Kai, he learns just how horrifying they were. We see in that moment that Johnny actually learns what he resisted throughout the rest of the series. Time moves on, and mercy and honor are worth more than winning. Deep. But how does that tie to yin and yang, the premise laid forth in the title? Yin and yang is the concept that the sum of parts of opposing forces keeps a dynamic flowing, like that shadow can't exist without light. In the case of Cobra Kai, we have the light of Miguel becoming swallowed up by the shadow that is Cobra Kai. Meanwhile, Johnny's son Robbie starts out a troublemaker, but Daniel finds the light within him to draw forth, teaching him Miyagi-Do Karate as Daniel himself was taught. In the same manner, Johnny is trying to get his life in order to leave things in the past where they belong, but Daniel doesn't give him a chance to prove he and Cobra Kai have changed. Daniel becomes a hypocrite for a time before he finally comes back out of the downward spiral he is headed on, spurred on by his wife, and in the end, he pities Johnny's past that he didn't know before. The two actually seem for a bit like they maybe they'll have a truce if not become friends. Then Johnny finds out Daniel has been training his son, and Daniel finds out that Robbie lied to him about who he was. Technically he didn't, but Robbie has his mother's maiden name as his surname, and he did start working for Daniel under false pretenses originally. Regardless, Daniel comes back to the light again when Robbie joins the tournament without representing a dojo. With Daniel eventually coaching him on through part of the finals. It isn't enough, however, as he hasn't trained as long as Miguel, who is being coached by his sensei Lawrence, whose firm convictions of the tenets of Cobra Kai end up twisting poor Miguel from a meek but nice teen into a mean and vindictive bully like Johnny was. Eventually, Miguel and Robbie end up in the ring after Hawk, one of Miguel's friends who is also in Cobra Kai, injures Robbie, setting it up to be similar like the first film. However, Johnny tries telling Miguel that he doesn't have to go all out, despite not telling Miguel that Robbie is his son. Miguel doesn't listen, saying that he taught his students their most important lesson, no mercy. This is why the final episode is simply titled, Mercy. Johnny wants to give Robbie mercy, but the situation is out of his control. The student has absorbed his sensei's teachings. We get a brief moment where it seems that Miguel might hit Robbie's knee, much like Johnny did in the first film where he apologized immediately after proving he knew better beyond just the look he gave his sensei. But thankfully for Johnny and Robbie, he doesn't, hitting Robbie's shoulder for his finishing move. Miguel fought without mercy, but he didn't do anything as bad as what Johnny had done, which seems a relief to Johnny despite the stunt Miguel did earlier to cause Robbie the added pain from the sharp yank on his arm. Miguel wins, and as the underdog of the first season loses, unlike the first film. Or has he? Who is the underdog here? Robbie, for fighting with honor under his sensei? Miguel, for being picked on initially before rising into power? Daniel, for being one of the only ones willing to stand up to Johnny and Cobra Kai? Or is it Johnny, for actually becoming the sensei that he could have been all this time, but was afraid to become like his own sensei? The lines blur as light and shadow dance, not only in the arena, but throughout the entire season. We root for Johnny for trying to become good, even if he is fairly ignorant and an ass. We root for Daniel for trying to stop the old Cobra Kai as it was. We root for Miguel 
who seems to be becoming popular, getting the girl. We root for Robbie, who's given the lesson that he doesn't have to be his father. We are heartbroken that Robbie and Daniel lose. We are heartbroken that Miguel and Johnny win. We are enraged at the ending where Sensei Chris returns, especially after we all heard that he was dead. We dread and ache to find out what happens in Season 2 knowing he has returned and that Daniel is opening the Miyagi-Do Dojo to more students. Light and shadow, powerful symbolism, but it goes beyond that. Yin and Yang is all about balance, not being too massively masculine or feminine to have no empathy for the opposite sex as Johnny seems to have originally. This before realizing that his first female student is a worthy addition, and not just because of the money which he needs. It is a balance in expectations versus reality, where we're shown that the underdog myth is just that, a myth. There are always two sides of the story, opposite sides of the same coin. Daniel was a jerk to Johnny in the first film, and in Cobra Kai. Johnny was one to Daniel in the first film, and again after Daniel harasses him. Who was right or wrong? In the first film, Daniel won, so we have his perspective, his version of history, as it is always written by the victors. In Cobra Kai, we see both sides at once, something the first film couldn't pack into its runtime. We see the balance in the inner beast versus inner peace, where Daniel's wife makes the two men form a temporary truce, and later with Samantha, who practices karate despite how her friend lost and how Miguel was a jerk. We see the hint of hope for Miguel in that he actually seems heartbroken that Samantha isn't there to see the final victory. Not just pride, but hoping that she would come back to him. It becomes all that Daniel fears because of Cobra Kai, something which Samantha feared. He learns to harness his inner cobra and becomes poisonous. Robbie, on the other hand, harnesses his inner peace and his legs become like the trunk of a tree, landing a surprise hit against Miguel. It isn't enough to win, but he is new to that peace, and Miguel has been a student of Cobra Kai for longer. We see the balance in the new generation being taught by the old, in the rivalry continuing. We also see it in how both sensei struggle with parenthood. Johnny, with Robbie directly, and also with Miguel, who is a figurative son, whose interactions with Johnny drove Robbie to approach Daniel in the first place, though at first just as a job, not for the karate. We see it with Daniel struggling to get his son to be more active and trying to get Samantha to stop hanging around with bad influences. Eventually we see her push beyond them, but it comes not from pressure but realization that in the case of her ex-boyfriend and one of her rich friends, they weren't worth keeping around due to their toxic influence. The other rich friend, Moon, however, apologizes and despite her ditziness, seems to have grown from seeing all the Cobra Kai students become badass. Hell, one of the students that she has originally joined in mocking, Eli, has become her new boyfriend, Hawk. She balances out somewhat at least, even if she only becomes Hawk's boyfriend after he has become a jerk rather than when he was still awkward. There is something to be said for the season as a whole compared to the rest of the franchise. The original series pushed for the franchise to grow, marketability to grow, and cranked out more and more films which got worse in quality, and also an animated series. Most don't even remember it. Cobra Kai, however, has shorter episodes but more depth, passion for new exploration of the traditions and nostalgia while still showing that time has truly passed, that the cast and the roles they fill have aged and grown up, even if they are more or less going through a midlife crisis. In addition, we see asides as commentary on social issues and political correctness, but at the same time we see that Johnny is learning how ignorant he truly was. While Miguel learns of the awesomeness of Guns and Roses and other music from before he was born, the old teaches the new and vice versa. We see it in the profane and the profound. While both Johnny and Daniel cuss, 
Johnny is far worse with it. Daniel eventually comes back to the wisdom of Mr. Miyagi, passing on profound wisdom to Robbie. There are also references by both men about the previous films, such as the glass cleaning situational humor by Johnny, and Daniel saying how he loved the part where Robbie would learn why Daniel had him doing so many chores. Technically speaking, however, unlike Mr. Miyagi, Daniel was his boss, so the tasks were already part of his job, just not on how they were specifically posed to do them. We also see it in the reference for the famous hand-rubbing Mr. Miyagi scene, as well as a few other gems. In fact, some of them are our red herrings and twists. Just like the claim that John Kreese is dead, or that the truce is broken when Robbie is revealed as Daniel's student. Or that Kyler actually is a sexist jerk in addition to being a bully initially, before he becomes a fearful victim of Miguel's justice. Note, his justice, at the time at least, because he wasn't fighting for himself, but rather white knighting for Samantha at the time. Granted, he learns that Samantha knew more about Karate than he did at the time, but he didn't know that when he tried to defend her. And he put Kyler and his friends in their place. Sadly, he doesn't take the lesson Mr. Miyagi would have taught, instead learning that it is awesome to get revenge as well as justice, letting his inner beast out of its cage. Mr. Miyagi, on the other hand, was a quiet warrior, one who wanted to avoid fighting instead of being thrilled by it. He hated fighting, but Miguel learns to love it. The issue here isn't so much that Miguel butted in and didn't check if Samantha had it handled, which she could have done if he hadn't jumped in, but that he took the wrong lesson. At that point, he hadn't gotten to the level of Johnny's misogyny, but he was learning it, while Johnny himself was learning that women could be just as badass as men. He learned that bullies of our generation were cowards compared to what he had been, even admitting that he had been one. But he saw some strange honor in the kind he was, and constantly kept pushing that his students should get revenge. Here, we see him slow to grow out of that mindset until the season finale. In life, you truly don't want to be bullied, but you lose yourself to your inner beast if you become a bully yourself. This is what being a quiet warrior is all about, not solely being a victim, but defending yourself and those who can't fight for themselves. When Johnny brings Cobra Kai back, he emphasizes a few times that certain attacks are for certain situations. But instead of teaching that defense should be the primary focus, he teaches what he was taught. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. This speaks to him, just as it speaks to Miguel, because we learn Johnny was abused not only by John Kreese, but by others as well before he joined the old Cobra Kai. He learns to hold his resentment longer than Daniel did, but eventually Daniel's own is stirred just as Johnny is learning to let go. The two clash and spin around this issue, as well as all others that are displayed within the season, except what makes them breach a truce. Moms are great, and that every real man knows cars and real speedway. Symmetry, and how Johnny and Daniel both were raised more by their mother than their fathers after their birth fathers passed on. You see Miguel, who didn't know his father because he was a bad man that Miguel's mother and grandmother fled from long ago, whose mother fears for him. And we see Robbie, whose mother seems incapable of caring and running off all the time, while his father, Johnny, clearly had been absentee most of the time, though he's trying to become part of Robbie's life again. Symmetry. Yin and Yang, balance, symmetry. These things clearly were planned aspects of the writing of Cobra Kai, in addition to seeing both sides of the skewed perspective both sides have had. Unfortunately, many seem to take on Johnny's initial ignorance as where he stays throughout the whole series, when he truly grows as a character. There we see the difference between symbolism and meaning, failed change and intent. To try and fail is still better than not trying. If you fail, you learn, as Miguel's grandmother suggested. 
It's taken Johnny a long time, but he is starting to learn that Cobra Kai needs to change. We can only hope that he can still change it in time now that John Kreese is back. We see his return foreshadowed by all the times he appeared in the memories of the two rivals, as well as the foreshadowing that Robbie would lose when Daniel's trophy was broken in the same practice space that his first started teaching Robbie within. Finally, I hope that many of you will have stayed till the end of this video. It was initially inspired by seeing the masterpiece that is Cobra Kai Season 1. But specifically after watching it and seeing how many people either defended all of Daniel's actions wholeheartedly in the previous films, or who thought that Johnny was the hero we specifically needed because he wasn't politically correct. Just as within the show, there's a need for balance in all of our lives. There are some who are ignorant to the disadvantages and hardships that others face that are in bad places, while there are others who insist that anyone in a wealthy or healthy lifestyle didn't deserve it, that they were handed it. We can never know what someone else is going through without asking. Johnny and Daniel both learned that lesson as they learned about each other, something which they hadn't tried doing in all these decades since their fateful match. There is something to be said about going too far with making assumptions. It doesn't make you a badass, it just makes you an ass. At the same time, there's something to be said for confidence in sticking up for yourself, and for others. That is, defending yourself, not striking first. Be slow to anger, redirect it where possible, and show mercy. If you go out and talk to most martial arts teachers today, they will teach you where possible, avoid the fight. Where that is not possible, de-escalate it. Tire your enemy by dodging and blocking, make them drop weapons, and so forth. And above all else, do not try to grievously harm or kill your foe unless you've already tried to avoid, deny, and defend yourself to a point where it is clear that you cannot incapacitate them or escape the fight as a whole. Stay safe, but don't become the monster in someone else's story. Well, that's all I have to say for this series thus far. We'll be producing more content for our channel soon, across multiple different playlists dedicated to different themes, as well as speaking about just who and what Fanfare Industries truly is. If you enjoyed this video, or it made you think, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. For now, we bid you adieu, and we'll catch you on the flip side.